welcome to what I think is the first talk of the critical issues track. First of all, can you all hear me all right? Okay, so I guess we'll just start, although as you see, two of the speakers are missing, but I'm sure they will join us in due time. Um, so I'll start with my presentation, which will be followed by Lucas, and hopefully by then the Wikimedia staff who gives the third presentation will have arrived. Um, all right, so welcome again. Thanks for joining me on this most dire day. Um, two years ago, I gave a talk that was entitled, Which Law Applies to Wikipedia? A question which I answered by all of them, which you may think is a bit counterintuitive, but actually it's true. Um, and those who were there may remember that I had two takeaway points. First, we cannot escape from the application of US law. And second, for everything else, it depends. I've now studied these questions for two more years, and unfortunately, my answer to most of them would still be, it's complicated. So with this talk, I have two aims. First, I want to show you why it's complicated, but also why it is so important that we talk about these issues. And second, to give you a broad overview over some of the different laws that apply to Wikipedia, which will hopefully allow you to navigate through them a bit better, and maybe also will provide you with a framework for the two talks to follow. Um, let's start by looking at an example. A couple of weeks ago, the UK Supreme Court rendered an important decision in a case called PGS and News Group Newspapers, to which I like to refer as the Can You Feel the Love Tonight case. Um, so in this case, a famous member of the British showbiz, whom the court labeled PGS, and who is married to an even more famous British musician, YMA, had an affair with two other people whom the court labeled AB and CD. Now AB and CD went on and sold the story to one of the high quality newspapers that are produced in uh, England. Um, and PGS got an injunction from the English courts that prohibited publication of these stories to the English newspaper in England. Um, meanwhile, the story was published in a Scottish newspaper, in a number of US newspapers, and all over the internet. It got shared on Facebook and Twitter and so on. And one of the questions the UK Supreme Court had to answer was whether they can prohibit publication of information that has essentially become public knowledge. Um, for the Supreme Court, this was an entirely domestic case. The parties were all in England, the facts related to England, and all they prohibited was publication in England. But for us, it raises important question of international law, such as, does an English injunction apply to Wikipedia? If so, does it apply to all language versions and talk pages? Because currently you can find information on this affair um, not in the main namespace, but you can find it on the talk page in the article about PGS, on the article about YMA, on the article about the court case, and ironically, on the article on the Streisand effect. Um, if the injunction does not apply, do we otherwise have to comply with English law? And what do we do where English law contradicts other laws? So to shed some light on these issues, I would like to take a step back and have a look at the different laws that can potentially apply to Wikipedia. Um, the first category I just quickly want to mention is criminal law, um, which is not overly important for our purposes. First, because most of the things we do are not criminal, or so I hope. And second, because criminal law is only applied by national courts. So the Italian courts apply Italian criminal law, and the English courts apply English criminal law. And this leads to a situation where the rules on jurisdiction of the courts are essentially the same as the rules on the territorial scope of these laws. This does not mean that these laws cannot overlap, but their scope of application is only defined by national legislators. So how broad or narrow the scope of application of these laws is depends entirely on the national legislator. Um, it is not really a problem of international law. And the same is true essentially also for other types of public law, such as tax law, corporate law, 
which fortunately the Wikimedia Foundation deals with for us. Um, but the fact that national courts apply national public law does not mean that these laws cannot have a very broad scope of application. And an important example for our purposes of this mechanism is data protection law. Um, data protection law in the EU, of which unfortunately the UK will not be a member in the future, but currently is. Um, in the EU, data protection law is governed by the EU General Data Protection Regulation. And this instrument has an awfully broad scope of application. Under its Article 3, um, EU data protection law applies whenever a data processor has an establishment in the EU, offers goods or services to EU citizens, or monitors the behavior of EU citizens. So this is a very broad scope of application. And presumably, this even covers Wikipedia if we consider the offering of information as the offering of goods and services. And there are some indications that we should. Um, the consequence of this is that the entire range of remedies under EU data protection law applies to Wikipedia. And this includes the infamous right to be forgotten, of which I know many of you are a bit scared. I think this is overstated, but certainly the broad scope of EU data protection law has some implications on our work. Um, I think even in the Can You Feel the Love Tonight case I quoted earlier, there's a data protection dimension to it, and I wouldn't be surprised if it weren't covered by the right to be forgotten. So let's finally have a look at the most important area of law, at least for our purposes, which is private law. The situation in private law is different from what I just described in relation to public law, because private law, of course, still is a creature of national law. So there is a body of English law that is English private law, and there's a separate body of Italian private law. But in private law, it's not uncommon for a court to apply the private law of a different country. So Italian courts can apply English private law, and English courts will occasionally apply Italian private law. Just imagine two Wikipedians who celebrate yesterday's referendum, maybe that's a bad example, um, who celebrate the stellar performance of the English team in the Euros, also a bad example, um, and have a nice glass of red wine here in Esinolario and forget to pay it. So the barkeeper will go to England and sue them there because they've come back to England. But in this case, the English courts will certainly apply Italian law because the contract about the glass of wine is governed by Italian law. Um, so what this means is that the questions of jurisdiction of the courts and applicable law are two separate questions that can have different answers in private law. Um, let's apply this to the Can You Feel the Love Tonight case. The first question here is, what effect does the English injunction have? Um, it does not have any direct effect, because injunctions only ever apply between the parties, and none of us is a party um, to this injunction, unless someone works for the Sun newspaper. But it has the indirect effect of telling us that publication of this material would be unlawful under English law. We do not know for certain whether it would be lawful under other laws, but there's a good chance given how restrictive English law is on privacy issues. The second question is which courts would have jurisdiction on such a case? Where would such a case be heard? It would certainly be heard in England, because in England, jurisdiction essentially only depends on accessibility. So as soon as content is accessible in England, this is sufficient for the English courts to have jurisdiction, at least on some part of the action. And unfortunately, the same is true under Italian law. So both the English courts and the Italian courts would hear such a case. The next question then would be, do they apply English law to that case? Because as we've seen, English law is particularly restrictive. And Unfortunately, again, the answer is yes, because the criterion that the courts apply to figure out which law to apply is they apply the law of the place of the tort. And here, the tort is publication, and publication happens as soon as content is made accessible. So both the English courts and the Italian courts would apply English law, at least to that part of the publication that happened in England but this is very hard to distinguish from other parts of the publication if it's an internet publication. So in these cases, English law would indeed apply. And what we see here is 
that it only depends on the content being available in England. It does not depend on other factors that we constantly throw around in our internal discussion. It does not depend on where the servers are. It does not depend on the fact that the Wikimedia Foundation is incorporated in the US. And it does not even depend on where you're domiciled, which is constantly said in our internal discussions. Um, because the application of English law does not depend on your domicile. English law can be applied to your actions even though you're not domiciled in the UK. I admit that a judgment may be more difficult to enforce if it's from an English court and you're not in England, but it is not excluded that it can be enforced. And so far, an English judgment is also enforceable all over Europe. This may change in the future. Um, so these factors do not matter. What matters is only that you made content accessible in England. I know this is very unfortunate because it creates a huge overlap of applicable laws, and I'm one of those arguing against this, but currently this is how the law is. So a final question, what is the extent of application of English law? Does it also apply to talk pages? The answer to this question is yes, it does, because English law simply governs the fact that you published something in England. Whether or not it treats publication on an article similar to publication on a talk page is a different question, but this is a question that English substantive law has to answer. It's not a question of international law. Internationally, English law applies to all forms of publication. Um, so I'm aware of the fact that all of this is awfully complicated, although I've simplified it to a degree where I feel personally uncomfortable with. And we haven't even talked about IP law and competition law and other areas that are fascinating, at least to people who find that stuff interesting. Um, but I think there's one other dimension to this complexity. And this is, it may make it difficult for us to foresee which laws apply and which kinds of liability we risk to incur. But it also makes it very hard for victims to defamation, to IP infringements, to figure out under which laws they can find protection and in which courts they are heard. So often it will lead to a situation where a person is legally protected but cannot find a way to exert this right. And therefore I think beyond all these legal questions, there's another question that we have to answer. And this is how do we as a community want to protect fundamental rights on Wikipedia? How do we protect rights to privacy, rights to reputation, the right to free speech. I'm afraid the complexity of the legal issue, of the legal situation here, increases the burden on our shoulders to come to conclusive answers to the question on, of how we balance out these conflicting rights. I know this is a huge responsibility, but this makes it all the more important that we face it. Thank you. So I think we have time for questions. Yes, we do. So feel free to ask them. I think there's a microphone going around. And uh, if Michelle and Jacob want to join us on the stage as well, on the podium, feel free. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, my name is Peter Isotalo. I'm a Swedish Wikipedian, and I was wondering about the data protection law. Uh, one of the applications is that people, if there is information about someone, they can in the future get that information for free. Uh, they can, are you familiar with this consequence of the law? So, uh, uh, the data protection law, I mean the one that's coming up in 2017. Yep. Uh, do, do, I mean all the detailed demands on service providers apply to Wikipedia? Um, I mean, that's a question that depends on the individual facts of the case, but in principle, problem with the broad scope of data protection law is that it applies in its entirety even to Wikipedia. And so I think if you, the, the problem, if you write an article that contains what is considered personal information, um, the problem is you have to observe data protection law. So you cannot publish personal information that is not obtained in a way that is considered lawful under the um, data protection regulation. The situation may be a bit different for the Wikimedia Foundation because there are some privileges, um, but 
I'm not, I'm not sure whether there's much that prevents the application of data protection law. I think in principle it applies, and it applies in its entirety. And it, this creates a huge tension between what we do, which is to publish information and the protection of privacy. But again, this is a situation where I think we have to come to, to answers that balance out these different positions. Because I know as a, <clears throat> I'm a trained archivist, so I, in Sweden, and I work for public agencies, and I know what a headache the existing law can be. Uh, but in the new law, which, as you say, no one really knows how it's supposed to be applied, uh, but one of the one of the things that you can demand as a as an individual is that if someone keeps information, if a service provider keeps information about you, you can you have the right to get all that information out. Yes, indeed. No matter the and the question is, would that apply? Can they can they go to the Wikimedia Foundation and say, I want a transcript of all the information about me anywhere, including talk pages? I, I guess so. Yes. I, I, I can't wow. see why not. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's the state of the law. Yeah, it is very broad, but it, it would apply. And the question is then, how do we handle this? Because as individual editors, it's very unlikely that someone will go all the way to court to just sue us to change an article that will just be then changed back by someone else. But for the foundation, this is a risk of liability, certainly. There's a question over there. Could you pass the mic? Yeah. Hello, I'm Ignacio from Uruguay, and there's uh, in this discussion about freedom of speech and uh, right to privacy. Uh, the, uh, for example, in the United States, they, the, the famous amendment says there's the freedom of speech, so people can say whatever they want because without it, uh, you cannot be free, right? But in, in Europe, there, there's um, uh, also the tradition of privacy, where what is personal to you uh, cannot be disclosed without your permission. But the, so how do we deal with this? Because there's cases, for example, in Uruguay, where uh, there's private information about a public person. And when this gets disclosed, the person says this is private information, but the person is public. So people have the right to know about this, for example, a politician, right? So how do we do deal with this issue? Yeah, I mean, that just links back to what I said. Um, the, the law contradicts itself in a way, because we have US law, which is very strong on the protection of free speech, and we have English law and other laws that have a much, give much more importance to the protection of privacy. And both of these laws can apply because jurisdiction of the courts is notoriously broad in internet cases, and the scope of application of these laws is equally broad. Um, so that's why I say the answer cannot be found purely in the law, because the law is contradictory and inconclusive. The answer has at least to some degree be found by ourselves, and we have to make a judgment call there. Um, of course, we probably have to be more careful in general with um, privacy, because Currently, we work pretty much under the assumption that the First Amendment protects all of us and everywhere. So that's why I constantly go on about English law being applicable nonetheless. But we, we have to find the balance ourselves. The, the law does not give us a conclusive answer because the law is too restrictive if we look from it, uh, at it from the one side and it is too broad and too lenient if we look at it from the, the opposite side. Hi, um, my name is Martin, I'm from German Wikipedia and I'm also a member of the volunteer support team and we are getting more and more requests about things on talk pages. You said that uh, privacy law also applies to talk pages, which is obvious but uh, which is a huge problem for us as we discuss all the stuff, whether or not something co is covered by the law or not on talk pages. So everything we talk about in Wikipedia is public and we don't have a non-public channel beside the OT OTRS, which is not made for that. Um, do you have any suggestions how to solve that? Is it just that we have to take down things as soon as somebody's deciding that may be unlawful? Or do we have to stop talking about private-related issues altogether? Yeah, that's a very, very important um, and pertinent question. I think there are two ways in which we could address them. First, we could go on as usual and see 
how to, to, to what extent we're actually liable for this, because that has not yet been tested in courts. We, we don't know necessarily whether courts will com consider this as defamation or violations of privacy. There, is some, there are some indications, um, and I guess most lawyers would say that at least some things that are discussed on talk pages certainly fall on the, under this kind of laws. Um, the alternative would be to proactively create some space where issues are discussed non-openly in a, I don't know, restricted area. But I'm not sure whether we want to go that way. Maybe it's better to test the waters um, <laughs> first and, and see how far the, the arms of the different courts reach. But there's a high risk that at the moment we are in a situation where we do some things that are not perfectly lawful. And at one point, they will be certainly come to the courts and we will see what they think about that. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. I'm Chris from English Wikipedia. Um, is there any precedent for courts dealing with talk pages? Have they ruled on this at all? Um, so I'm not aware of anything. Maybe Michelle is. I don't know. Is, is, is there that... any precedent that deals with talk pages particularly? Claims uh, dealing with content on talk pages. I'm sorry, I'm not as tall as them. Um, <laughs> But for the most part, it's been treated very similar to um, article content in terms of evaluating it from a free speech angle. One distinction that is sometimes made is that uh, when people are talking about something on a talk page, it's not being asserted as a fact necessarily, which makes a difference for defamation mm -hmm. uh, in particular. So it's more difficult for privacy law, but in defamation areas where you're like trying to debate you know, what sources to use or what information to put in an article, um, nothing that's there is necessarily being said as that's definitely true about somebody, which might change how it's evaluated for defamation purposes. Any more questions? Otherwise, I... Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, James, also from sort of the UK, but I work for the foundation in San Francisco now. Um, the corollary of your observation about uh, civil law being enforced in different countries than the one that their nominal jurisdiction is, is, is that you end up with a kind of lowest common denominator jurisdiction of the entire world, which means that laws that say you can't defame the king in Thailand apply here in Italy, that laws that say you can't depict humans in Saudi Arabia apply here in Italy, and so on and so forth. And it, it strikes me as unlikely that that is intended um, and would somewhat violate the uh, European Council's uh, Convention on Human Rights of freedom of expression, for instance. So the balance between these is interesting and hard, and I don't think there's uh, a likely way of it getting resolved soon. What do you think? Yeah, I think your observation is entirely correct that this situation is unsatisfactory and not necessarily within the spirit of the law, but apparently within its letter and for many courts all over the world, this has been good enough in the past. Um, there is some pressure to redefine certain of these questions in certain jurisdictions, but we are in a situation where the um, scope of application of many of these laws in fact, is much broader than presumably it was intended, and we're not yet at a stage where this is fully embraced and actually tackled by legislators. It, it, we, we, at, at one point, we can, of course, discuss this and um, try to um, improve that situation and work towards change, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that currently it's, it's like this, and the risks of liability are probably higher than we like to think. <laughs>